Stay tuned for later in this video to see how you could win a GMC Hummer EV Edition 1. Every day, more Americans work with Chevys than any other truck. Up early. Back in 1959, Chevy and GMC introduced the CK, their first trucks developed on a dedicated truck platform. Over four generations and 40 years, the CK pickups, along with their companion SUVs, were GM's largest selling and most profitable model line. However, back in the 90s, GM's biggest moneymaker became one of its biggest liabilities when its third generation CK was embroiled in a controversy thanks to the questionable placement of the truck's fuel tank and it turned into yet another example of the media lying for the sake of ratings. This is the story of the Chevy and GMC CK pickups. This is my old car. Just like with GM's domestic rivals Ford and Chrysler, the pickup is the most important and profitable vehicle that GM has had since the 1950s. Wheels are rolling, rolling all along the highway. Wheels that keep a rolling all the night and day. And just like the crosstown rivals, the Chevy and GMC pickup's original mission was for work, plain and simple. It wasn't supposed to have a comfortable ride or any luxury appointments. It simply had to be tough, durable, and reliable. Although the CKs were the first GM trucks to put more focus on the comfort of the occupants, I'm sure it is safe to say that when the CK was first offered for sale in 1959 for the 1960 model year, no one back then could have imagined how much pickups would change over 60 years later. All across the USA. In 2022, if you live in the US and have an extra $112,000 burning a hole in your pocket, you could buy this all-electric GMC Hummer pickup. But what if you don't have that kind of money, or don't have the right connections to move up higher in the massive waiting list? Well now you don't need either, thanks to the sponsor of today's episode, Omaze. Omaze is offering you the chance to win an all-electric Hummer EV Edition 1, while at the same time supporting a great cause, rebuilding together. Go to omaze.com slash myoldcar to enter for your chance to win. Rebuilding together makes essential repairs to help your neighbors stay in their homes and they have local affiliates that work with communities devastated by natural disasters, not just in the immediate aftermath, but also their long-term recovery. The original CK was one tough truck, but it didn't come close to the Hummer EV's 1,000 horsepower and 11,500 pound-feet of torque. With its three electric motors, the Hummer EV can reach 60 miles per hour in just three seconds. When switched to its watts to freedom mode, it has a range of 329 miles and can get back almost 100 of those miles in 10 minutes with DC fast charging. It also has luxuries the original CK could only dream of, such as a Bose 14-speaker sound system, transparent sky panels, and GM's exclusive Super Cruise self-driving technology. Oh, and did I mention it can crab walk? So for your chance to win an all-electric Hummer EV Edition 1, go to omaze.com slash myoldcar and enter now. Donations support the amazing work of rebuilding together. As far back as 1905, General Motors has included pickups in their lineup, initially under their GMC division, but even Buick offered a pickup in 1916. Chevrolet offered their first pickups in 1918, and like all the light and medium duty pickups GM would produce up through the 1950s, the platforms weren't specifically truck platforms. The predecessors to the CK pickup, the Chevrolet Advanced Design and GMC New Design from 1947 to 1955, and the Chevrolet Task Force and GMC Blue Chip series from 1955 to 1959 were variations of GM's A platform that was also shared with cars, such as the Chevrolet Deluxe and the Oldsmobile Series 60. It wasn't until the introduction of the CK pickups for the 1960 model year that GM would have its first dedicated truck platform. The name CK referred to GM's internal codes for designated rear versus four-wheel drive. C-series pickups were rear-wheel drive, whereas K-series pickups were four-wheel drive. Although the Chevrolet and GMC variants of the CK were essentially the same trucks underneath different trim, each division named their trucks differently. Chevrolet had the number 10, 20, or 30 following the C or K to indicate half-ton, three-quarter ton, or one-ton payload capacity. GMC instead used the numbers 1,000, 1,500, and 2,500, and they also didn't use a C to identify the rear-wheel drive trucks instead just using a K on the four-wheel drive trucks. Everything smooths right out as never before. Chevy and GMC even had different names for the bed configuration, with Chevy's fleet side and GMC's wide side 
being the straight sided bed versus the Chevy step side and GMC fender side for the more traditional exposed rear fender design. And the same new platform was used for the fifth generation of the Chevy Suburban and GMC carry all models, which just like the pickups only had two doors for the passengers. Engine offerings were inline sixes, V6s or V8s ranging from 135 to 165 horsepower and from 217 to 280 pound-feet of torque. While that may sound small for a pickup, it was plenty of power for its day. By 1966, the biggest engine option, a 5.7 liter Chevy small block V8, could make 220 horsepower and 320 pound-feet of torque. Although I had noted near the beginning of this video that pickups of this era were more focused on hauling cargo than passenger comfort. Why don't they make a truck that rides like a car? What a bummer. The CK pickups had three distinct improvements that showed GM's commitment to improving the driving experience. The first was the frame itself, which instead of having arrow straight ladder frames, were redesigned to dip down under the passenger compartment. This not only provided easier entry and exit, but it also lowered the truck's center of gravity for better handling. It was also wider than before, providing six more inches of width in the cab, making them their first trucks to offer three across seating. The second improvement was swapping out the traditional leaf springs for coil springs on the rear axle, which greatly smoothed out the ride. And third was a torsion bar independent front suspension, an idea that some GM engineers initially feared would be more fragile than a typical solid axle. But they managed to engineer a design that worked well and allowed the truck to sit seven inches lower, making for easier access to the bed. Unfortunately, those second and third improvements were limited to the rear drive models, as the four-wheel drive models retained leaf springs front and rear with a solid front axle, but the vast majority of the trucks sold back then were rear-wheel drive. The first couple years of the CK had a bit unusual look in the front, with the hood sculpted to accommodate air intakes and turn signals. The windshield also continued a design trend from the 50s, with a wraparound windshield and vertical A-pillars. The unusual hood design didn't last long, as for 1962, the hood was flattened out, and by 1964, the A-pillars were redesigned to a more modern look. Chevrolet has sloped that windshield pillar forward. That makes it easier to get in and out of, and it's true on all of the 64 Chevrolet trucks. Which also required changes to the roof, doors, and interior. By 1966, a huge improvement made it into the cabin, thanks to optional air conditioning. The second-gen CK started in 1967, with a more streamlined and simplified look, dubbed the Action Line, the second gens were the first to offer a top-of-the-line trim package called the Cheyenne Super, complete with a wood grain trim dashboard. The Suburban and Carryall models finally offered a much-needed additional door, although only on the passenger side. The popularity of having a large enclosed truck prompted GM to offer a smaller version for 1969, based on the half-ton pickup model. These smaller SUVs were the Chevrolet K5 Blazer and GMC Jimmy which proved to be a big hit, thanks to their open-top design that allowed for both convertible and more weatherproof hardtop models. Both Chevy and GMC would later continue to use the Blazer and Jimmy names on smaller SUVs based on the compact S10 and S15 pickups in the 1980s. Check out my S10 Blazer episode to learn more. The second-gen CK gave way to the third-gen model for 1973 and changed the name from Action Line to Rounded Line. This name was meant to imply that improvements were made in the overall shape to improve aerodynamics, thanks to more intensive wind tunnel testing. Although some of the corners were rounded a bit more, the overall shape looked even more square than before, resulting in most truck fans ironically referring to the rounded line as the square body. The third gen is also easily identified by the shoulder lines that wrapped around from fender to fender. And don't try anything either, I got a tire iron right where I can get at it. The interior began to look a bit more like GM cars, with controls and gauges moved closer to the driver. Although the front end initially maintained the older rounded headlamps, later models would move to square headlamps, with higher trim models offering a pair of square headlamps on each side. The third gen models were also the first to offer a shift on the fly from two to four wheel drive, at least when driving under 25 miles per hour, beginning in 1981. And the third gen was the first TKs to offer a four door crew cab option, which also carried over to the Suburban. However, the most significant design change, at least in terms for what the trucks would become well known for, was in an area most customers wouldn't have noticed, assuming they didn't have a good sense of smell. The earlier generation CKs had the gas tank situated inside the cabin, which had a tendency to emit a not so pleasant odor, not to mention increasing the risk of any fire reaching the occupants. This design also limited the size of the tank, making it difficult to increase its fuel capacity. As a result, part of the new third gen design was to move the tank to the outside of the frame rails, 
offering a 20 gallon tank on the passenger side or an optional additional 20 gallon tank on the driver's side for a total of 40 gallons, each with their own fuel cap. This fuel tank design, known as side saddle, had many critics both inside and outside GM who feared the risk of a side collision with no protection from the truck frame would puncture the tank and easily spark a fire. Those fears were soon realized as GM did their own study in 1973 and concluded that the new design resulted in more leakage from the tanks than the prior models. By the mid-70s, the number of fatal fires was increasing that could be directly attributed to the fuel tank's location outside the frame rails. Several new designs were considered, including a steel cage that was placed around the tank, but only worked for cab chassis models without the truck bed, starting in 1978. For the CK pickup sold with the bed attached, one of the GM execs suggested a $23 shield placed around the tank to help prevent punctures. Yet believe it or not, their cost-benefit analysis determined that $23 was far too much to spend per truck. So as a result, the CK pickups sold with the bed had their fuel tanks left unprotected. Are you sure it isn't time for a colorful metaphor? Although the fourth generation CK pickups, which started with a 1987 model year, were redesigned to move the fuel tank back inside the frame rails. The heartbeat of America, that's the day The third gen model still sold well, so GM wanted to provide a transition to the new model. The end result was having the third gen CK continue to be sold alongside the newer models between 1987 and 1991, but with a different name, now called the RV series. But the new name didn't mean any change to the third gen design and so the dangerous fuel tank placement would continue until 1991. The third gen model was one of the longest runs of any model in GM's history at 18 years. Before 1992, GM had managed to keep news of tank fires and their associated injuries and deaths out of view from the general public. That all changed when the NBC news program Dateline aired an episode dedicated to the risk of explosions with the third gen CK models. There had already been federal investigations in progress by that point, but like any good news story, NBC knew it wouldn't make for good ratings unless they could show an explosion occur as a result of another vehicle colliding with the side of the pickup. But in a similar manner as was done with other cars, like the Audi 5000 and Suzuki Samurai, which were also featured in my old car episodes, both the cars and trucks were rigged to achieve the desired result. That's it. Unbeknownst to NBC execs, or so they claimed, the truck used in the crash footage had incendiary devices placed at the point of impact, which could be triggered to explode on command. In addition, the fuel cap was the incorrect size for the fuel filler tube, making it easier to pop off during the collision, and therefore easier for fuel to spill out and burn. GM did their own investigation, where they analyzed the footage and could see smoke coming from the truck before the collision occurred. GM sued NBC for defamation, which led NBC having to do their own investigation, where they determined the Dateline producers were behind the stage explosion, leaving them no choice but to have the Dateline anchors admit their wrongdoing on air. NBC's contractor did put incendiary devices under the trucks to ensure that there would be a fire if gasoline were released from the truck's gas tank. Needless to say, several NBC employees consequently lost their jobs. GM says since the gas cap was the wrong cap for the GM filler tube and because the gas tank was overfilled, the cap came off when the impact occurred. Although the public was now aware that much of the Dateline report was a lie, GM wasn't exonerated either. Federal investigations continued, and by 2009, over 2,000 deaths were found to be the result of fires due to collisions involving the fuel tank. That's 20 times higher than the vehicle most everyone thinks of first when it comes to fuel tank fires, the Ford Pinto. I admittedly made the same comment about the Pinto in an earlier episode, not realizing it is nowhere close to the CK. Yet somehow the Pinto's failure is what we all remember. The National Highway Traffic and Safety Administration, or NHTSA, did try to convince GM to issue a recall on over 6 million CK trucks, but GM refused and instead held their ground that based on the requirements of the time it was built, the design was safe. Despite all the litigation, GM ended up only having to pay $51 million towards various safety programs. Yet to this day, no specifics have been documented on how that $51 million was spent. No ma'am, no dip As I noted before, the fourth and final generation of the CK pickup had moved the fuel tank back inside the frame rails, which many may think was in response to the negative publicity the third gen models had. However, the fourth gen design had started well before the fire risk had become so prominent in the media. As part of the discovery process during the federal government's investigation into the fuel tank fires, the NHTSA claimed that GM had withheld hundreds of accident reports and that GM was aware of the increased risk since the third gen began in 1973. So considering this, it makes sense that the fourth gen models 
now known by the internal GM code name of GMT400, wouldn't make that same mistake. This generation would last until the year 2000, and although the square body line is often a favorite of enthusiasts, despite the fuel tank issue, it is the fourth gen I tend to remember seeing the most on the road. The most dependable, longest lasting trucks on the road. Ghosts. I think that may be because, despite so many other cars moving to more rounded, even jelly bean like shapes, these trucks look more like a carryover from the very square trend of the 80s, so to me, they tended to stand out more. They actually were slightly smaller than their predecessors, although they had more interior room. Chevy and GMC also offered a Z71 trim, the letter Z matching the naming scheme of other sportier trims from their car lines, although for the truck, it wasn't meant to be faster, but instead was a better off-road package. It admittedly was a bit confusing in this generation's early years, as there was a four-year overlap with the third-gen production, so for a while it was possible to own a newer third-gen model than some fourth-gen models. It was during this generation that GMC abandoned the CK moniker, and instead took one of its previous trim levels, the Sierra, and make that the name of their full-size truck line. Chevrolet had been using the name Silverado as their top trim line for the CK, but that name too would become the Chevy's truck line official name when the fourth gen ended. The fuel tank scandal clearly didn't stay in the public eye for long, as the sales of the CK continued to climb through the 90s, with the combined Chevy and GMC full-size truck sales topping over 600,000 each year. I suppose brand loyalty must have played a role here, since fire risks managed to end some other car lines much quicker. Today, the Silverado and Sierra truck lines live on, although with a continued push towards electrification, these full-size trucks will have their biggest challenge they've ever had to keep their fan base. Over at Ford, reservations for their F-150 Lightning have gone way beyond expectations, and their hype seems to overshadow GM Silverado EV launch. To me, that popularity shows how many people love trucks, but never really utilize them to their full potential as these first EV trucks simply won't be able to pull the same size loads over long distances without significant recharging time. Will we get there someday? Yes, I believe so. But I think it'll also make many truck lovers yearn for the old days of the original CK. <coughs> Thanks for watching. If you like this video, click the like button and subscribe to my channel. You're not exactly catching us at our best. That much is certain. If you once owned a car from the 80s to mid 2000s that you rarely see today and would like it featured in a future episode, Leave a reply in the comments or contact me at the email shown here. See you next time. You guys like Italian? No. Yes. Yeah, no. no. Yes. No. Yes. I love Italian. And so do you. Yes. <laughs>